This week on my channel, I posted a video about the recent JWST results revealing a detection of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere of the exoplanet WASP-39b, a molecule that can only be made in a planet's atmosphere by photochemistry. Chemistry triggered by starlight itself. As part of that video, I interviewed my colleague, Dr. Jake Taylor, the University of Oxford, who was involved in this research using JWST to study WASP-39b. Now, our chat was heavily edited for the original video, which I'll post in the video description down below if you want to check that out first for a bit more of an explanation. Otherwise, you can stick around here to watch our unedited chat all about the plans to use JWST to study exoplanet atmospheres. Thank you so much, Jake, uh, for talking to me today. Can you start us off with just like a, a summary of, of what these five papers have found? Of course. So originally, there's only going to be four papers. So the four papers were supposed to be um, each instrument mode and how each mode um, could best analyze an exoplanet atmosphere. But then we ended up seeing SO2. So we had to chuck this fifth paper in there. So originally, each paper, we found different subsets of molecules because each instrument mode observes unique spectral um, re spectral ranges. Um, but they also overlap, so we could verify what we're finding with each instrument mode. So, for example, with nearest SOS, which goes from 0.6 to 2.8 microns, we can really capture part of the optical and then into the infrared. And in the optical area, we have sodium and potassium, whereas an instrument such as NIRSPEC um, G395, which focuses on three microns to five microns, we can't see those molecules. So we're really utilizing multiple instruments to find multiple different species. So this was like the first time that everyone's got their hands on JWST data, right? So like, what was it like either working with that data or being part of that big collaboration that was the first to get some of JWST data? So I remember when the first um, press release happened and we, thought, we saw the first spectrum and I was just mind blown. And so in, in my subfield, we use something called Slack. It's like an IM messenger for like work. And this was going just insane. Everyone was typing, oh my God, I can't believe what we're seeing. And some people actually grabbed the spectrum from like the, the image. And we started doing like atmospheric modeling on the spectrum from like the TV screen. And we were just like, what can we see? Are we seeing water? Are we seeing this? So it was a really, really fun time. Um, and that was just day one. We were already seeing these amazing things, just day one. Um, that was with what 96 b right? The first planet spectra they released. Yeah. Yeah. And a fun fact, uh, I am now leading the paper on that, that planet. So stay tuned to see, to see the finalized results on, on that spectrum. Because originally the spectrum that they showed us in the press release was more for outreach purposes. It wasn't for a science purpose. So we've now really dug in to the observation and tried to tease out the best signal that we can. And so we've managed to find some interesting things. So I can't wait to share that with everybody soon. And was there, with was 39 b was there like a eureka moment when SO2 was first, I guess a re eureka moment for the digital age, because it was probably over Slack possibly. <laughs> um, but the work was led by your colleague in Oxford, right? So were you around for that sort of, oh my God, that was what that is. So we worked in the ERS community in a very collaborative way. Um, but one thing we did do is to not bias each other, we didn't share the spectrum with each other for about a week. So each team individually worked on the spectrum themselves and tried to extract the information. And what we found when comparing is every single person's reduction had this mysterious bump. And that was the, oh my God, what is this moment? And then all of the atmospheric modelers and chemists were throwing their models, trying to figure out what can this be? This is, our models can't predict this bump. What's going on? And then, so, um, my colleague in Oxford ran some photochemistry models and realized that photochemistry is in play in this atmosphere and it's producing this SO2 feature. And that was just, that was the Eureka moment. That must have been so amazing to be part of that collaboration for like, the, the first time, right, that it's been seen outside of the solar system. Working on these data sets in general, it's been like the most fun ever in science because it's real time science. We managed to do all these results within two months. We've been working so hard, but it's been fun. It's been extremely fun. It's honestly the most fun I've ever had in science, despite it being really high stress. It's because it's so new, so revolutionary. 
we've been preparing for years for this data quality and it's just it's exceeded expectation two months is i mean for people watching like that's insane like normally i would expect a scientific paper to take a year you know from like data collection and then reduction and analysis and then even just writing the paper would take me longer than, than two months so the fact that you've been able to do it in such a short time i mean kudos to you guys yeah previous work i've done on hubble data has taken a year to go from start to finish but from this we've managed to write five papers in the span of two to three months we got off our first observations at the beginning of july we got our last observations end of july we're now end of november so it really it's been we worked all through summer to try and get this done so everyone in the community can see how amazing the spectrum is and then they can plan for cycle two they can now plan their own proposals based on what we find. So they understand how good the instruments are, then they can select which instruments are best for them to actually um, do their science. Because this was just in time too, right? Because cycle two was announced, like call for proposals, deadline, end of January was literally last week. So, I mean, you, you've really like been like, oh, just in time. <laughs> so everyone, yes, you, you now know how the instruments perform. So go and do your science. You got this. Can you just explain to people though, why from an exoplanet scientist perspective, photochemistry is so important to you? There are, there are a few reasons. Um, the first reason is more specific to exoplanets. And basically, by finding this photochemical product, we can really get an understanding of the interaction of molecules in the atmosphere. And then we can understand how much of certain molecules there are. And this can tell us is if there's an enhancement in the atmosphere of certain molecules. And this can then tell us how the gas giants form. And when we understand these sort of processes, we can then figure out how our own gas giants form, because we don't know. And so these are the first steps in understanding these things. The second reason is similar to what happens in Earth, um, ozone is formed from the same chemical processes, photochemistry. And so if we're now seeing in other planets outside the solar system, this gives us really good hope that it's happening in terrestrial planets that could have similar atmospheres to Earth itself. And so it's a really good stepping stone for this. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, I guess it makes us feel less special, which I guess we shouldn't be excited about. But then at the same time, we are. <laughs> All our perfect conditions for Earth to form, but we're now finding out it happens everywhere else. And so hopefully that could be in the future. Yeah, that's really exciting. So what is the future, do you think, for both, I mean, JWST in terms of the exoplanet community, but then also for yourself as well, like what research are you hoping to do next? So this is also a very complicated but intriguing question because I like a lot of stuff. And I know everyone loves to say small planets, terrestrial planets, but I really love the big planets. So I try to explain it in a few ways. First of all, these really big hot planets have clouds. But the clouds are made of metals. They're made of sand. They're made of these materials that are solid on Earth, but they're in like vapor and gaseous, for gaseous form in those planets and they condense. So some planets could rain glass. It's just these extreme laboratories that we can study and understand really extreme physics. I just, I love that. Um, one thing that I'm currently working on, which is, um, really interesting is I'm part of a geo program, which is a guest observer program. And we're studying the phase curve of GJ 1214 B. So a phase curve is we observe the planet through its entire orbit around its star. And GJ 1214 B has been the most extensively studied planet um, to date using HST, Spitzer and other telescopes. But all our results show um, a flat spectrum. So basically, it's either got a really heavy atmosphere or it's really covered in aerosols and clouds. Well, they just reflect a lot of sunlight. So what happens is because the, um, the aerosols would be so lofted high in the atmosphere that it just blocks all the light completely. So at every single wavelength, um, all of the light's being blocked equally. And so it's just flat. Um, but Miri LRS, which is the mid-infrared, you can see through haze because the particle size has become really small. And so you can see through this haze and we can now look, see what the atmosphere is like. So we have this program and we're currently looking at it and it's really exciting so far. So hopefully that should be out soon as well. Oh, so you, it's you so what I want to say, but I can't say just yet. 
Okay, I, okay. I, there's you so much that I want to us. say. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will do. Okay, you'll keep it secret for now. But yeah, that's really exciting. And then the Wasp 96B work as well that you're leading. Yeah, so Wasp 96B, um, which is another hot Jupiter, um, and the spectrum's really nice and clean. We have two papers coming out on this. One's led by a graduate student um, in the University of Montreal, and the other one's led by me. And yeah, we're seeing some really cool stuff. I really can't wait for everyone to see it. Um, and then Trappist, Trappist, we're doing Trappist. Oh, so you're involved with Trappist as well? Yes, I am. <laughs> so you're going to bring me back again. Um, yeah, so right now we're looking at Trappist 1b, which is the innermost planet in the Trappist system. So it's a little bit hotter than the other one. So it's just outside the Goldilocks zone. So we're not really expecting it to have um, life or, or any of those things. But it's still really interesting to characterize because if we can understand how different planets in the same system and how the atmospheres vary, we can really understand how like the formation of these systems and how they vary as a function of distance from its star. And it's just, yeah, I'm really excited for that one too. It sounds like it's such a cool field to be involved with at the minute because so much data is coming in, data that people have dreamed about for so long as well. And such very different systems. It just, it just feels like every piece of information we've always wanted to know is, is almost going to be there and ripe for the taking. Yeah, it's, it's actually been really bizarre because previously we were in such a, such a realm of no data. And so we were all with our theorist hats on predicting what we could see. And now we're getting so much data and there's not enough time. We want to work on this and do really detailed analysis, but also we want everyone else to as well. And so when we get the data out into the public, then every other team can then look at them and then build up more science and test their theories. So, and this is only cycle one. Web is supposed to go for 20 years. So we're going to be studying a thousand planets, maybe. I think we had about 70 in cycle one. So if that happens for the next 20 years, it's going to be a lot of planets. Going to need a lot more PhD students to help analyze yeah, that data. As exactly. Well. <laughs> For any sort of budding exoplanet PhD students watching, can you sort of just tell us what the atmosphere is like? Atmosphere, boom, um, in the exoplanet community right now. So right now, it's it's buzzing. It's electric. Everyone is happy to collaborate. Happy to share. Um, one thing that I really love is in the early release science community, in the trans team community, the, the senior scientists really emphasize lifting up early career scientists. So each of the instrument paper that came out, each is led by a PhD student. I think that's incredible. So these PhD students were pretty much the leaders and were organizing all of us together. And it's a perfect time to get into the industry. And because we're such a young field, the energy is also super young. And we are part of a culture change in physics. We, we, we attract this type of person, I think. We're curious, but we're also, you know, um, a bit different. And it's like a new sort of science. And so it really attracts that sort of interested person. I, I would say. <laughs> I love that. Thanks so much, Jake, for your, just talking to us about your science. It, it, it's, it's fab to hear. I love it. Planets are the best. I love planets. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up planets. I mean, I'm always going to love black holes, but if I hadn't, if I hadn't done galaxies <laughs> and black holes, I think planets would have, uh, would have drawn me in. Hey, there have been a few papers about planets transiting black holes, right? Or orbiting black yeah, holes. Yeah, true. A few of these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could uh, definitely, no, they're not the super massive variety. That's, that's where my heart Yeah, true. Been. That was Dr. Jake <laughs> Taylor at the University of Oxford. And I'm sure you'll join me in saying a big thank you to Jake for giving up his time to chat to us. So as we heard from Jake, there's so much more still to come from JDBST and its exploration of other worlds. And you can bet when those results drop, I'll be explaining them here on my channel. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on those. But for now, you know, this week's results are just one more step along a very exciting road.